But yeah, I'm, I'm also a musician, so I kind of write lyrics. and. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I know that. So, yeah. Well, it's kind of wide open then what you what you might want to do with this, too. I mean, is it is it like memoir, your story, and then including other stuff in it? And that's something in... in
Yeah, yeah, we'll fix it. Yeah, I think so. I check. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, hopefully you guys can hear me out there in Facebook. I really apologize. Um, for... so you guys can hear me out there in Facebook. I really apologize. Okay, I okay, so I just did. Yeah. All right, yeah, I don't know what was going on there. Super echo. Okay. So hopefully everybody can hear us out there. We really, really apologize. Um, we didn't want to miss out on anything uh, Dr. Grover had to say. Um, so if we can just pick up back where we left off, and I do believe we we're talking about Masabe Kong and the land of the giants and um, everything is big. Um, but as long as recording I'm recording in progress, um, I just want to, I just want everybody to know that we're going to have, uh, um, you can ask questions. You can ask Dr. Lagarde uh, questions at the end of the interview. That'll be closing right around 630. So we'll, we'll kind of break just before that and uh, we'll be available for questions. I just wanted to mention that. So, um, yeah, I, I, again, apologize and thank you for bearing with us. Thank you for staying with us here uh, for tonight's KBFT event. It's brought to you by KBFT and the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Again, um, Dr. Linda Lagarde Grover, our special guest tonight. And uh, yeah, as long as I'm here, I just want to um, just comment on Dr. Grover's um, books and her style of writing. And I, I have um, been blessed by her, her words and her teachings, and um, I, I think she's just a great writer and, and definitely just um, um, an asset to the Boys Fort Band and, and to the state of Minnesota. And, um, you know, she's an educator, a professor at UMD, but also she is um, teaching the culture through our books, through her books. And uh, I just want to just um, commend her on her work. And uh, miigwech. Oh, miigwech. But Chaz, I, I appreciate your kind words. And Darren, thank you for pulling pulling us together here. And, you know, miigwech to everybody who's, who's joined us. And I'm fine, Chaz, with questions or, or comments at any time. I don't know if you, if you want to read them to me and let me know. Um, you you know feel free to to jump in and do that and um, I know I was talking a little bit about about Gitchigami Hearts and that's um, its little subtitle there is stories and histories from Masabi Kong and that um, Masabi Kong is is one of the one of the names of um, that's well there's many places that that are called the place of the giants or where the where the giants are but for for the purposes of this book I'm I, I use that as one of the words for Duluth for the Duluth region here and in um, and I'm referring to the to the big rock rock ridge the giant rocks that go from um, south of southwest of Duluth Fond du Lac area all the way up into Canada and also to the point of rocks the big outcropping thing that is right in the middle of Duluth and kind of divides Duluth in half so I've got histories here there's 
Um, there's historical research, there's some fiction, there's a little bit of poetry in here, and there's, oh, there's a few pictures in there too. And uh, a lot of it is the story of um, re referring back to my family. So I suppose, you know, it's uh, my story too, but it's not, it's not really an autobiography. It's, uh, it's more of a, a combination of things where it's kind of a, I don't know, it's like a, a love letter, I guess, to this place, you know, that's, you know, we're, we're so tied by our history and by our by our spiritual ways, our our beliefs, our cultural ways, we are we are tied we're tied to the land, and, and you know, and, and it's our you know it's our it's our blessing to tie to the land in that way. And I talk some a little bit in here about you know like treaties, and you know I don't really go really deeply into this, but you know who often you know when I'm when I'm talking with groups of people, they want they want to know who. You know how how do you decide who's who's Indian and who's not Indian? And we all know that's a, that can get to be a kind of a complicated question here. But when I think of that that historical tie and those religious ties to the land, I think I think that really goes goes a long way to to getting kind of a little bit of a, a grip on you know what does it really mean? And you know to us as Anishinaabe people, what does it mean to us to be Anishinaabe? You know what? What are you know? What are the you know the great gifts we've we've been given, and what are our what are our obligations? You know, what do we what do we do with the the gifts, the history, and the cultural things that that have been um, that are so rich for us? So I um I've enjoyed doing the the research on this. I I enjoy historical research, but I also really like writing fiction and writing. Um, Writing things that I that I think might, you know, might add to something in in the world here. It can be a it can be a you know kind of a challenging challenging thing to be to be writing about you know our our history because it can be difficult and our cultural ways because they're so they're so precious and they're you know they're they're God given they you know we we must care for them and and make make sure that we do our very very best with them they are they are there for us and for the world but they are not here you know just to be used and exploited by us so it's 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 uh that's something that you know i've been learning you know all my life and um and you know that's another the the wonderful things about being Anishinaabe is the the idea that we we're learning we're learning all through life. I mean, we start learning probably before we're born. We learn all our all through our lives, and I expect we learn after our bodies are gone here too. It's um, it's it is our way, and to pass what we have learned in you know the proper way, you know, after the proper preparation and prayer is also part of the learning. The person who learns is also a teacher as they go through life. And so I think that is part of what Gitchigami Hearts is all about. I feel like I'm doing a at this point doing a commercial here. <laughs> oh no, that's that's great. Um that's what we're here to do to promote your new book. And uh, where can we get that new book? Um, it's at the bookstores in Duluth here. Zenith has it. The um, the bookstore at Fitzgers does. Barnes and Noble has it. You can order it. Um, you can get it on Amazon, and you can order it from the publisher from the University of Minnesota Press. So it's uh, it's it's something you can get. I'd also like to talk about the cover a little bit, if you can see that. It is a really, really pretty cover, and it looked a lot better when, when you put it on the um, invitation for this, for this event, Chaz. It's, um, it's an actual photograph of a piece of beadwork that was, um, that is Jessica Goki's work, and she is, she is um, a Redcliffe woman, and she does, she does beautiful bead art, and you know, and other art forms too. And when she when she allowed us to use her her work on this book, you know, she was, you know, she was. I think she was happy to be asked, and we were just really pleased and honored that she would do that because it is, you know, it is Ojibwe Ojibwe style beadwork with the you know the flowers and the vines and the leaves and the you know the beautiful flowing. I also like it because it's got strawberries on it. You know, like. Uh, you know, O'Dame and, you know, the heartberry. Yeah, it's definitely a beautiful 
cover beautiful art and uh, Jessica is a really renowned artist and really no well known for her style of beadwork. So that was that was a just a great um, fit. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know our our beadwork is kind of identifies us who we are being Ojibwe. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, sorry. and even the even the designs of the beads themselves. You know we are we are a you know what we're one of the woodland woodland tribes the woodland cultures and so the um, Anishinaabe Ojibwe beadwork then reflects that that life and that you know that reverence reverence for you know for all things that that are growing and that we're walking on even you know even the moxins I mean you know I you know I've, I've heard we probably have all heard that um when um when Ojibwe moccasins are made with that fl that floral design, those those vines and flowers and leaves, that it's in honor of all the all the small living things that we actually are walking on, and it's so it's really a prayer a prayer of thanks, you know, to have them on your moccasins, and and as you walk, then your feet are are continuing that prayer. That is that is what I heard, and you know, it's a it's a beautiful part of the culture. Definitely. Um, yeah, I just kind of want to learn a little bit about your past. Um, can you tell us about um, what it was like for you to grow up? Um, now where did I, you grow up and when did you start writing? I, I was born in Duluth here and that's where, where, I, where I grew up and um, I lived on the range for a while in Hibbing. I, I went to school in Duluth here. And um, my generation and my family was the first generation of children that just um, expected that they would be able to, you know, go to school and live at home and not, you know, have that removal or the threat of removal, you know, that the couple of generations before us had had with the boarding schools. And so we were kind of like, um, you know, pioneers, I guess, like Star Trek or something. And um, and so we, we were... Um, we were out there going to school. It wasn't easy um, going to school in the 50s and 60s here. I it never it never occurred to me or to any of any of the other children, native children in school that we might ever actually there see such a thing as a as an American Indian teacher. We we never ever saw that. And um and we think, you know, I think we, we would have liked to do that. I would have liked to be a teacher. Um, I had no idea how you go about that. I tried going to UMD. I finished high school. And um, I think the graduation rate when I was in school was probably around 10% for Native students. It was very, very low. And I started UMD, but I didn't succeed. I, I failed really, really quite, quite badly, you know, just started there and barely started. And then just, I was not, I was not prepared to do that. I had no idea. How do you go to college? <laughs> you know? So I went to work and I was a telephone operator and I did lots of different things. I got married. I helped put my husband through school and we moved up to the range there. And in Hibbing, um, as in a lot of places in the late 70s, there began to be these little Indian education programs in the public schools. And my kids were just going to be starting school. And a group of parents in Hibbing wrote a, a grant um, and got some money that they hired a, a part-time Indian education coordinator. And so I, I met her when I was um, pregnant with my third child and my my oldest was just starting kindergarten. And after, after about a year, they, um, they had enough money that they, they thought they really needed a part-time secretary. And so I applied for that. And that was my first, I'd been on the parent committee, but that was my first, you know, job in Indian education. And eventually um, she, she moved on to another job and I became the coordinator for Hibbing Public Schools. And that was, um, and at that time, it was, now this is before internet and stuff like that. And so yeah. if it wasn't for, if it wasn't for Net Lake, if it wasn't for Gary Donald and Gene Goodsky and um, Fred McDougall and, you know, all, all, all those people and, and Joanne Donald, I mean, all those people who, who helped us and helped us get a cultural 
program into Hibbing schools, you know, that was supposed to be encouraging children to go to school. But, but with that, with that strong cultural base and that sense of, of pride and, and um, great appreciation of, of being Anishinaabe, that was really what the, that little program was all about. And so those were those were really fun days. And so we would be we'd be back and forth, you know, going up that up uh, up the highway to Net Lake and back. Gene Wood Sky let us come and observe him and his class, you know, in the Net Lake School before this is before they built the the um the one that's now. In fact, when we first started there, they hadn't even built on to the original school, which was one of those old brick ones, you know. And um it had Man, oh man! I think the septic system was wild there. I mean, they seem to be always working on that thing, and they always treated us, you know, Anishinaabe style, like we were special company when we go up there. I mean, they'd be they'd be cooking duck for us, and um, just um, just made us made us feel like we were so welcome and that they were so happy to help us. It was those were those were really good days. Yeah, that was. Uh... That was during my days. <laughs> oh, I might have seen you there then. So you might have one of those little kids running around. <laughs> I bet, yeah, because that's when I went to school. There was was before it was all added on. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, it was. Uh, I remember that they had a room for the for the teachers where they could. Um, well, I don't know. I think they might have had. A, I think they might have still smoked in there in those days. But it was about the size of a little bedroom, and they'd all be crowding in there and. <laughs> doing their doing their prep work and stuff it was so fun so I worked for there and then I um then they opened up a program called um services to Indian people at the um, community college in Hibbing and in the Arrowhead colleges and I applied and got a job there and I was I went back to school part-time and the parent committee in Hibbing was very supportive um there were very few native people who you know who had um gone to college or graduated so that was once again you know breaking breaking new tracks and stuff and encouraging encouraging people to go to the um to the community college and then I moved to Duluth and I got a job at UMD I got a secretary job and continued going to school part-time there too so I became one of those people who went to school a lot for a long time part-time and eventually finished so you know anybody who's here who's wanting to do that wanting to pursue you know goals like that you know just you know I I sure you know I sure just send all my all my good wishes and encouragement to you um I had a friend from actually she's um it's a white earth, white earth lady who, when I was working in Hibbing, she, um, she came to work there for a while and she had a college degree. And, and I, I just said, Oh man, you know, that'd be so great. And she said, and she said to me, you're smart. <laughs> She's, she said, you, you could do it. She said, if I could, if I could do it, you, you sure could. And, um, and I, I kind of kept that kind of close to me in, in the years that I was going, cause it was, it, I, I found it to be, especially after having, you know, failed at UMD trying, I, I found it really intimidating. And working at UMD too, I, I always tried real hard to, to look for those students who might be struggling. And just to, you know, even, even saying hello in the hallway can make a difference. Yeah. Um. I like how you talk about some of those old, those old um, Shinabe people, uh, Gene Goodsky and Gary Donald and Fred McDougal. I, I mean, those those people they're the they're the ones that really started up a lot of the um, a lot of good things up in Boys Fort. You know, began with them. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And Joanne Donald too, and the ladies, they were, they were just so nice. They were just so nice to us. And they, they, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be, we wouldn't be where we are and have what we have if it, if it wasn't for them. And they, uh, they've certainly, they've certainly left us and are, are still continue to give us quite a gift. Mm -hmm. So, so I've been writing, you know, I used to write little stories and things when I was a little girl and, um, and my mom saved some of those. So, you know, once in a while in my stuff around my house, I'll find something like that. 
Um, but I didn't really write the, like with a with any kind of goal in mind of publishing stuff till till I was really um, till I really was out of school, out of graduate school, and so that was like in the late nineties when I started thinking I I might be able to do this. And it's and it takes a while, you know. And so I know all the all the people at Boys Sport who are who are writers, you know, that great great group of people. There are so many Boys Sport people who are really talented, gifted writers. Um, you know, I I think about them a lot and try to send them, you know, my best thoughts too. Because yeah, you know, you once I started doing this and I'm sending my stuff out and getting getting rejections and rejections and rejections. I started, you know, I started, you know. I, I realized, oh, I knew this all the time, that that isn't really the reason that a person writes anyway. I mean, you really, it's, you know, you really want, I think most people want to get their stuff published, but, but writing for itself is just something that I, I think, you know, many people just really, really want to do. They they feel like they want to do it. And I don't mean all day, every day, because I mean, you know, days days go by where I don't write anything. But, you know, I, I know, Chaz, you've written some cool um, fantasy type stuff. I mean, you don't do it every single day, right? No, no, just I just it's just something that I I just started that I just picked up. Um, but however, I write poetry, I write music, um, lyrics, songs. Um, and I know in Boys Fort, there's a lot of talented writers up there, um, you know, that that are in the community. And uh, that's what some of, that's what we're trying to do here with this writing series is we're trying to um, highlight some writers that are out there in Minnesota, plus mm -hmm. inspire people to, to pick up that pen or to pick up their laptop and just start writing. Uh, and to uh, inspire people, especially the youth, and encourage them to, to try writing, um, because you know you can you can definitely it's something um, you can definitely make a living at, um, a very good living at if you're really good. Well, yeah. Well, I think Stephen King makes a pretty good living. <laughs> <laughs> So, and you know, the, the thing is too, um, I used to just kind of throw, throw things out that I'd written. And then um, after a while, I just started saving, saving stuff. And so, you know, I mean, hang, hang on to your things, you know, if you're writing and if you're, if you run, you know, you run out of what you're going to say, just put it aside and, but don't throw it because you might be able to use it for something else sometime, you know, and um who, who knows what it might turn into? I mean, what, you know, many, probably all the time where I start and think that I'm going to go is never, never the direction that things finally take. And it's kind of fun to see where it goes. I think of it kind of, you know, and why, what people write and why they're writing. I kind of think of the, you know, the, um, of the old time way of, of, passing knowledge of teaching and learning and you know the oral tradition you know by by stories and by telling people things and also by you know example and physical stuff and you know observing and then trying it out I think of that as the way I I think writing is um partly I think it's that process but I think that might be the purpose too here I mean there's you know, in in the old time ways of doing things, there's never one person who knows every single thing, right? I mean, there's many people who each know something. And I think that's how this writing fits together in the world. And then when we're thinking something that's closer to us here, think of the think of the Anishinaabe people or or um, or the boys sport people, that we are passing knowledge maybe you know for for what it's worth i don't say i know anything but um but passing passing things on in somewhat the way that people might have done a hundred years ago yeah that's one of the things that i really noticed in your style of writing is there's a lot of teachings that are hidden in there a lot of um, cultural aspects that are hidden in your in your words and um this very like inspiring for me and being a native american to read that you know like i i feel like 
like I can relate to that style of writing and it's, and it's very, very good. Um, you know, you're, you're one of the best writers up here, uh, in, in my opinion. Um, but, um, I just want to, um, know well, who influenced you. I, I know there's a, a cultural inf influence, but is, is there any, any one or any style that kind of influenced your writing? Well, you know, when um, N. Scott Mamaday won the Pulitzer Prize, and that was in 1968, I remember seeing that on the news and sitting there, you know, my by my dad, and we're like, he's like, wow, look at that, you know, it's it's a, an Indian guy, he got the, the Pulitzer Prize. We didn't know what that was, but it was big enough to be on the news, right? And so that I that really stuck with me that um, that my dad was taking pride in something that another Native person had done, and that was that was an example to me seeing that. And so, you know, there um, now there there's more Native writers you know out there than there ever have been. Though I think people have been writing for a long time, but now I think there are more who are being noticed. So, you know, Louise Erdrich, of course, when I first read dance our um um love medicine when it first came out i i just opened you know the first couple two pages in there i'm like wow you know i would I, I would love to tell a story like this and that was inspirational to me too so i like to read i like to read other people's stuff you know a, a lot and i do and there's such a variety of um uh, the younger writers who are coming out. I mean, they're, um, they're, um, I'm in touch with a, a, a younger writer named Carson Faust who lives in the cities and he's, his tribal people are from the Southeast there. And so he's, he's writing things that are kind of fantasy like things. I think you'd really like his stuff, Chaz, if you don't already know it. Um, but there, and then Erica Wirth, who lives in Colorado, is um, writes about um, younger people who have some are really dealing dealing with some things in society that are not in my own experience like gangs. I mean, what were gangs when I was a kid? Um, and just um, really doing this in a way that's that's very very realistic. Um, and um, oh, there are so many. Um, Eden Robinson has done that. So you know, these contemporary writers are—it's something that is really, really exciting to me because I can see them almost like uh, taking off like rockets from things that you know some of the established writers from like the '80s and '90s laid that foundation for that. So, so yeah, I, I love reading other people's stuff. That, so often I read something, I go, man, I wish I'd written that. <laughs> yeah, I, I love books too. Um, you know, there's, it just, they, they can just take you to a place, you know, a different place or to new places. And, and I love di reading different styles, um, you know, but I always, I'm always reading about five books at a time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, chapters here, chapters there from different books. But, um, you know, I just, I remember all of it though. Um, um, yeah, we have about 15 more minutes left and I just want to open it up for questions. If anybody has any questions out there, um, feel free to message them on Facebook or on Zoom here. Okay. Yeah, I saw somebody had a hand up a while ago, but I don't know where it went. But maybe they would. Maybe they'd do that again. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I can see somebody named Janet with their hand up, and they could unmute, maybe. It's. Oh, I heard it says something. it says the host won't allow it. Oh, can you hear okay. me? Can you hear it now? I can hear you. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. All right, then it must be working. Okay. First of all, Dr. Grover, I want to tell you, I, I absolutely love your lyrical writing style. It's just so, it's I it's compelling, and I love the way you tell the stories. I feel like somebody's just sitting there telling me stories. I could 
do it forever. So first that. The other thing is that Chad, Chad's kind of mentioned something about influence and your inspiration and so on. But he also mentioned about young writers. Um, and I was wondering, uh, you mentioned that you'd been writing since you were a very young person. And I wondered what you would say to young writers, what what ideas you might have for them or what things might motivate or inspire them or, and what did that for you as a younger person? I think, I think to a, to a young writer, I would say just, um, I know it sounds really simple, but write something, just, you know, just sit down there and write something and just be, begin with something. I mean, maybe, maybe you've just got a paragraph and you've, maybe you have a thought or something, but write something. If you want to do that and you've never done it before, and then you have it there in front of you and you can start with that. I have little bits and pieces of all kinds of stuff. I actually still have a whole bunch of them that are, um, that are written on little scraps of paper that I put into a plastic grocery bag and hung on a doorknob. And I actually still have a lot of those. I eventually put stuff into a box, a cardboard box, and just pull pull things out, pull things out and work on them. So I have a number of things going on all the time. And I would encourage a young person or any age person, you know, to, to do that, just write something and hang on to it. And then you might have another idea that is completely you think, unrelated to that, go ahead and write that down too. And but don't, don't throw your stuff out. And I think for me anyway, writing it down really helps because you know how you think of things in the middle of the night sometimes. You know, you have these really great ideas and you're going to remember them in the morning. <laughs> I don't know if anybody ever does. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah, I do that all the lost. time. And then, then when I, yeah, then I, I always say, I always put it off. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to remember that in the morning. Then when you wake up, you don't remember nothing. <laughs> <laughs> you just wonder what, what the heck was that? <laughs> so, so for a while there, I actually had, um, I actually stuck them in a drawer in the um, in the dresser next next to the bed. Um, I haven't done that. Oh, you know why I haven't? It's because it's technology. I have a phone now, so if it's really important, I just send myself an email in the middle of the night. This is within reason, of course. I mean, you want to you want to sleep too. <laughs> there you go. Technology, right there at its finest. I used mm -hmm. to actually use the voice memos and, and actually like say a lot of words that I'm thinking, or mm -hmm. even if I'm, if I have a melody in my head, I'll just hum it into the, into the, the voice memo thing the, or the recorder on the mm -hmm. phone. Even that's how I remember a lot of my stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Then it exists, you know, and, and you may or may not use it, but it's there for you, you know, and there's a reason I think that things come to you in the middle of the night too. I don't know what the reason is, but I think there is a reason. Oh, definitely. Um, you know, like um, a lot of our elders say that that's where our ancestors kind of we interact with our ancestors is through the through our dreams. Mm -hmm. That has something to do with it because a lot of the things that I write, I don't and the ideas that come to me, I know I can't think of on my own. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, and that's something else that I. That I've thought of sometimes, Chaz, because um, people talk of, when they say creative writing that, you know, that's kind of a that can maybe be a little intimidating to think of that concept. But the way I think of it is that I'm not actually creating anything when I write. I'm just taking something that's already there and I'm like the, the I don't know, the conduit or something. And um, and so I, you know, I, I think that that is a I think that's an outlook that that has made it possible for me to write more than if I just sat down and thought to myself, okay, create something. I just go, what am I? I'm not, I'm not the creator. I can't do that. Um, but things are already there, right? Exactly. Um, the conduit is a, is a great word. Um, you know, just, uh, that's how I kind of think of myself is, is, is I just kind of open myself up to, you know, whatever want to comes through me and then whatever come comes out to my hands or through my mouth, mm -hmm. then, um, then that's, you know, uh, that's where my music comes from. That's where my lyrics come from something mm -hmm. else, I believe. Mm -hmm. 
you know, I was thinking a little bit more about what you were saying about young people and what would what would we say to young people? And um, and you know, it might be a good idea to think about um, you know when you want to write something, what why do you, why do you want to write it? You know, I mean, what is what is its purpose? And I know um, a lot of a lot of people write things that are um, that can be you know that that word cathartic, you know kind of clearing things for yourself. But sometimes, and I've, I've, I've worked with students who have, have written things that are really very, very personal. And, you know, I certainly am not going to share them with other people. But I think a person needs to, needs to, to think too about how, how much you're going to share and how you're going to share. And do you really want to share this? Or are you writing it for, you know, for yourself? in your own spirit, maybe, you know, to, to give some thought to that. That's, that's one, um, that's one way that I think writing fiction is, and, and I bet fantasy type stuff too, Chaz, um, is that gives you a barrier between what you are really saying here, and what the person reads on the page or hears. And, um, and when you were talking about like things that are kind of hidden, yeah, they are kind of hidden in, in my stuff. And um, I know one of my sisters, um, she, she was actually up at the boys fort um, at the heritage center at the gift shop. And she didn't know the woman working there. And she saw my book, one of my books is there. And she says, Oh, is this book good? She's, and the lady said, yeah, it's really good. It's just like being here, you know, which is funny. But then my sister told me, she asked my mom, you know, did you read? This, did you read this? What do you think? And my mom said, well, we're all in there, but Linda only left all these little clues. So we're the only ones who know what she's really talking about. And I think that's, I think that's can be really important in some of the things that a person wants to write that may be really, you know, difficult or, or personal. I mean, you don't have to, unless you choose to, you don't have to lay it all out there. Yeah, exactly. Um, that's, um, you know, one of the benefits of being a little bit creative or having that little creative spark. Um, but also being a writer, you could hide behind like a, a pseudo name, you know, like Richard Bachman, if you're Stephen King, per se, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's a fun, a fun way of, of writing, I guess. It's, it's it is, behind. it is. I'll have to try that because maybe they'll make a whole lot of money. No. <laughs> And so, and I look at Stephen King, I mean, he writes stuff, and many, many, many people read his stuff. He's a very popular writer. Um, and if that's the direction that a person is, you know, fe- feeling, you know, moved to go, then go in that direction. Um, if you're feeling introspective, you know, and writing only for yourself, there's nothing wrong with writing only for yourself. And you may, and what you're doing with that may change as time goes on too. You might turn it into a, you know, a, a pretty good fiction work or a, a poem or a, or a song. Yeah, yeah indeed. Um, we just have a few more minutes left. And um, I, again, I just want to thank uh, Dr. Um, Linda Lagarde Grover for chatting with us tonight and talking about her book and, and uh, some of her influences and, and telling a little bit about herself. Uh, it's always an honor to chat with you and to see you and to meet with you. And, um, and I'm looking forward to the next book. And uh, that, whenever that may be, we'll be, uh, we'll be watching here at KBFT. And I'll just, uh, again, want to thank our sponsors, KBFT, the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. And I'll, I'll leave these last moments for anybody that has questions. And thank you for tuning in tonight uh, for KBFT's live Facebook feed. And uh, yeah, miigwech. Oh, yeah, uh, make, miigwech. A couple um, things that people posted on Facebook, um, just a comment uh, on the book's artwork, that it, it's beautiful. Um, uh, somebody commented about school here. Yeah, my phone's being super slow now. 
Hi, this is John Roderman. Can I take a quick minute to thank uh, Dr. Lagarde Grover for having us in here to to uh, hear about the uh, the book tonight? I was a student of uh, Dr. Grover's at UMD, and mm -hmm. uh, she helped me with my writing. And I really uh, enjoyed her class and her writing style. And uh, I'm I'm putting that work to to uh, to work now working on drafting the Minnesota Chippewa Tribe Constitution. Yes. So, uh, yes. My, uh, writing that. And uh, thank you for the uh, for the help with my writing, because, yeah, it, oh. it's, hopefully we'll pay dividends. Oh, you know, and it's so, yeah, it's, it's so great to hear from you, John. And I remember your writing so well, and I just enjoyed reading, reading your assignments so much. And I, I feel so proud that you're, that you're, you're doing this, you know, working on the constitution of like, like this. I mean, it's such, such necessary work. And, and I mean, we, I can see that, you know, the, the future right out ahead of us. So miigwech for doing that. Yeah, miigwech for your instruction for uh, this meeting tonight. Yeah, thanks for watching, John. Uh, yeah, there's a couple of comments here. Enjoying your interview, Linda. Miigwech, Chaz. Um, also looking forward to the next book and how to go to college. You helped me with that, Linda. Uh, so again, uh, get your gummy hearts, Linda Lagarde Grover's new book. And be sure to pick that up at on Amazon. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some bookstores in Duluth that carry the new book. Uh, and uh, where else could we find the book? You know, I think if I think if you were to Google it, you would find it because um, a, a number of um, independent bookstores and gift shops carry it also. And so you you um, I think it would be easy to find just Googling the name of the book. Mm -hmm. There you go. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Independent is always the best way to help the little, mm -hmm. the little guys out. Mm -hmm. And and again, um, thank you so much for chatting with us tonight, Linda. And it's always a it's always an honor and a pleasure to uh, chat with you and uh, you know to visit with you and and I always like listening to your words and um, and hearing your stories and I also like reading your books. You're a very very talented writer. Oh, miigwech. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks, KBFT. All right. You're welcome, man. <laughs> Have a good night out there in Facebook land. Okay. And, uh, miigwech. We'll see you next time. Okay. Gigawabba, man.